we've been exploring through this series called Holy Habits. And we've been looking at this idea that we can make day-to-day decisions that lead us closer towards Jesus and closer towards the lifestyle that he encourages us to live. We're firm believers that holy habits are there to guide our lives, not govern our lives. Which means the choices that we make depend on our desire to be intentional or not. Habits are not to be defined as legalistic, rather as intentional acts which support us in our journey of the Christian faith. During our time together so far in this series, we looked at biblical teaching in week one, where we looked at the importance of knowing what the Word of God says, how it is important as Christians to be prepared in and out of season to share the truth about what the Bible says about the situations that we find ourselves in. It's important that we can be real with people, with real truth. In week two, we had Cassie looking at fellowship and the importance of sharing life together, how it is important that we live within community with one another. In week three, we had Duncan bring our words on the holy habit of worship and how this should be our default position before God, that we should be in a constant state of worship, remembering that it is God who was, who is, and who would always be on the throne. And in week four, we looked at the power and the importance of prayer, that we have this incredible privilege that we can call God by Father and Creator. This idea that he is transcendent, so above all things, yet deeply intimate in his commitment to us as our Father. We explored that through looking in the Lord's Prayer and how actually the Lord's Prayer actually encompasses the whole of our lives. If you weren't here for any of those messages that we've looked at so far, can I encourage you to take a look either on YouTube and search Eiffel Baptist Church, or alternatively you can head to our website and you can find the links there. And the habit which we'll be exploring in greater depth for a few moments today is this idea of serving. And our main text of this series has been taken from Acts 2, 42, which looks at how the early church applied a series of decisions which became habits, which became a lifestyle. And Acts 2, 42 to 47 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the press, and all came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and their goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had needs. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all of the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being sent. As Christians, part of our tradition has been to seek holiness wherever we are and and in whatever we're doing. And as such, our theology, our foundation of faith, is created through this idea of service, this expression of a servant heart. Christian serving is an expression of our understanding of God's desire for just world. And our common calling as people of Jesus is to serve our friends, our family members, our partners, our workplaces, our schools, our communities, our cities, our towns, our villages, and so on. When we serve, we become more than just volunteers in church. We become participants in his story, in his kingdom story being worked out here on this earth. And I want to ask the question this morning, have you limited your service to just the idea that you volunteer in church? Because if you have, then let me encourage you that it is so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're participants in his story being worked out amongst our community. We see central to Jesus' ministry that relationship was often built through acts of serving. It was through this relationship that Jesus sought to establish and proclaim his challenging counter-cultural message of repentance and forgiveness. And we know for ourselves today when we look at the grand narrative of the Bible, which means the complete picture of what the Bible seeks to convey through its various books and writings. And from this we can establish this concept that Jesus, when sent from heaven to dwell amongst us, was both a king and a servant. 
And this shows an incredible contrast. There are a number of instances in the Gospels where Jesus attempts to teach the disciples something about the importance of their role here on earth. In Mark 10, 43, verse 45, it says this. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It's a particularly strong statement, one which you cannot really imagine the disciples understanding at this particular point. What was it that he was trying to explain to them? If you were considered a servant back in biblical times, you would have been considered the least of the least. You wouldn't have been considered as important, you would have been looked at almost with disgrace. To be a servant was to be of no position within a household. Yet I think what we can take from this today is that Jesus would be prepared to humble himself to what people would have considered less, so that the hearts of those who he ministered to would be made for more. Jesus would be prepared to humble himself to what people would have considered as less, so that the hearts of those who he ministered to would be made for more. Had Jesus not been prepared to demonstrate the level of depravity that he would expect his disciples and us as modern day disciples here today to experience, then our hearts would not be able to start to understand what was coming next. Our hearts need to be shaped into what it was and who it was that we were expected to be. I believe that Jesus demonstrates this significantly later on. When before the Passover meal, he and the disciples arrive at the place of the Lord's Supper. And upon arrival, he asks the disciples if he can wash their feet. Grace so beautifully read this passage for us earlier. But let's again take a look at some of the verses from John 13, 1 to 17. If we start from verse 2, it says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. He humbled himself to what would have been considered less, so that the hearts of those who he was ministering to would be made for more. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Now this was significant. Jesus and the disciples would have, compared, would have covered a fair few miles. They would have walked a long distance to have got to this particular house where they were going to have the Lord's Supper. And back in those days, they only wore open toe sandals. So you can imagine the dust and the dirt, and some may even go as far to say the poo that they may have trodden in on this particular journey. Yet despite all of that, despite what would have been considered quite a grim job, I don't know whether I would have done it myself, but yet Jesus lowered himself to a standard of a servant. He got down on his knees, he filled a basin full with water, and he washed the disciples' feet. He ministered to them so that their hearts would be made for more. Jesus, King, leader of the pact, saviour of the world, would take upon lowering himself so that the hearts of those who he ministered to would be ready for more. If we skip a little to verse 12, it says this. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place and he asked this question. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
Not that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set to you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus had to demonstrate himself as a servant so that we may demonstrate ourselves as servants to others. Jesus would serve himself in a situation which would have been considered beneath him because of who he was, so that the hearts of those who he ministered to would be ready for more. De Jesus demonstrates this contrast that greatness is not the domain of the strong, though it requires strength, but in the role of one who plays servant. Actually, Jesus demonstrated great strength in lowering himself to what would have been considered lower in that position. <laughs> the message is simple this morning. It isn't long or drawn out, although you may be feeling like it is. I'm coming to my final few points. It's this. Serve others in the way that Jesus served his disciples. He was secure in who he was, and we can be secure in who we are when we know that we are his. He was secure in who he was, and we can be secure in who we are when we know that we are His. It means accepting that even through His greatest act of service, service which we will join together in shortly, our hearts can be made aware of the vastness of His love, so that we may serve others in a way where they would know and experience His love through our actions. Jesus wasn't concerned about what people thought of Him when He got down on the floor to wash the feet. Should we be concerned of what people think of us when God asks us to do something bold and courageous through in our service? I think part of what I love about the call to be a servant is this idea that we can bring life wherever we go. I've had conversations in the past where Johnny says, where people have said, Johnny, I don't feel like I'm called to be an evangelist. But that's okay, because actually we're not all called to be evangelists, but we are all called to serve and bring life wherever we go. We are called and served to be light and soul and the hands and feet of Jesus wherever we go. So yes, we may not be evangelists, but we are called to bring life through our acts of service wherever we go. Just as through the knowledge of when we take communion, we can be assured through our repentance and salvation through Christ alone that we can be saved. We can tell others about that, bringing them literal life to wherever we go. We are not only treasured this morning with the call to serve our community. We are trusted. We are trusted. God has entrusted us to serve his people. Both in this room here today, the ones that we know who are part of this fellowship, but some would say even greater than that, the ones who don't yet know who we're called to serve them too. Though sometimes we may abdicate from his glory and fall far from his trust, because we are humans and that is what we do, he still crowns us in majesty and righteousness and forgiveness and repentance. So therefore we can be assured that there is nothing that we can do that would make him love us more. And there is nothing that we can do that would make him love us less. Because regardless of who we are, it is about who he is. And he has entrusted us. We are treasured. We are trusted. This morning has been on serving. And I want to publicly use this time to thank those who serve in the life of this church. Every cup which is loaded into the dishwasher or washed up on a Sunday morning. Every tea and coffee poured. The chairs which are put out and put away each week, the sound which we listen to, the visuals that we have for our words. Our children's work both on a Sunday and on a Friday night. Our students, our worship teams, the greeting that we're met with on with a, the greeting that we're met with upon arrival. We could not do what we do without every act of service that we have in this church. So thank you. If you were part of those teams, thank you for turning up and contributing. 
it is through these different acts of service, many which we don't notice or even pay attention to, or may I even say that we take for granted sometimes. Well, we have the privilege to serve others so that we may also experience the love of Jesus through what we do. Each person who serves in this church is invaluable. To finish, let me close with these final two points for you. Firstly, often we can think to serve God, we must become less and he must become more in our lives, which isn't wrong. Yet I want to propose a different concept. God wants all of him inside all of you. He wants it to be all of him in all of you. His greatness is never dependent on making you less. It is demonstrated in raising you up with Christ. We do not proclaim God's sovereignty by devaluing who we are and our own humanity. It's the opposite. He invites us in. He invites us to be image bearers. And image bearers are filled with God. It says right at the beginning of his words that we are made in his image. You are made in his image. And therefore, our prayer should be, all of you, Lord, in all of me. Because actually people need to see you sometimes before they see Jesus. Because if they just saw Jesus, they may not accept him. But if they see you, you may just help them accept who Jesus can be. To be human is to be his. You are allowed to be fully human in who it is that he calls you to be. Secondly, Jesus humbled himself to less so that the hearts of those who he ministered to would be made for more. Don't be afraid to maybe do something that you would consider lesser if it means that actually the ones that you're ministering to will realise that there's a God who loves them and who treasures them and who will take themselves to a point of what we consider less but was actually making people for more. We are made for more. We are made for more. Our motivation behind serving lies in our commitment to understanding the cause of the gospel. And just as Jesus came to serve to show us how to, may we also look for opportunities this week where we can serve others. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that you humbled yourself as a demonstration so that those who you minister to would be made for more. And as a result of that, Lord God, we can stand here today. We can be part of this congregation here today because of the fact that you humbled yourself to what would have been considered a lesser state in the hope that our hearts would recognise who you are and be made for more. Father, I pray that in our weeks we will realise that we are participants in your story rather than just volunteers. Lord God, I pray that we will seek to bring life wherever we go, in the interactions that we find ourselves in with friends, family members, colleagues, school friends, partners. Wherever we find ourselves, Lord God, wherever we go, may we take the life that you have given us and show it to somebody else, so that they too may come to know you for themselves. Father, we pray that you will work through us, that you will encourage us, that you will help us have a bold faith, a proper confidence in who it is that you say you are. Lord God, you are so secure in who it is that you were called to be. May you help us to be secure in who it is that you ask us to be. Father, we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.